Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's NCVI webinar. I'm Peter Cooper, and today's webinar is going to be about running the prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline on your own data. With me uh, today is Francoise, and we we'll also have Doug online. So Doug will be available to answer technical questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Francoise, who's going to talk about PGAP. Hello, my name is Francoise thibault -Nissen. Um, I am the team lead for the uh, Prokaryotic Genome Annotation Pipeline, or PGAP, at NCBI. And uh, with me is uh, Douglas Slada, who is the technical lead for the project, and uh, who will also be able to answer questions that are uh, more technical than I can answer. So the outline of the talk for today is first, uh, we'll review what um, the place of annotation is in the biological analysis workflow. Uh, then we'll provide a brief description of what standalone PGAP is, what the history was and what it provides. We'll spend a good chunk of time uh, talking, providing an example, start to finish annotation using PGAP on your own data. Um, and then we'll give a couple of tips on how to run PGAP on assemblies that are, I would call, preliminary assemblies, which means drafty, drafty, drafty assemblies. And finally, I'll go over a couple of features that are in the works. Um, so just as a reminder, PGAP is available on GitHub, and the link is uh, at the bottom of the slide. So a genome annotation is really a core component of uh, many whole genome analysis. Annotation of a whole genome is the determination of gene location and gene function in the genome, and um, it's a precursor of many downstream analyses, including comparative genomics, building phylogenetic trees, exploration of biochemical pathways, discovery of virulence factor, and the list goes on and on. And I will argue that it's also an important component uh, for the assessment of assembly quality, and we'll get back to that point. Uh, so PGAP uh, was started at NCBI about 15 years ago. It is used to annotate uh, almost all RefSeq assemblies currently available in GenBank, which is over 170,000 assemblies from bacteria and archaea. Uh, and it is also used uh, for the annotation of many assemblies that are submitted and that are in GenBank proper. Um, it is an automated pipeline that predicts um, the structure of coding genes as well as non-coding genes and also uh, provides functional annotation. So on the coding gene side, um, the core components of uh, the pipeline are uh, protein homology. Most of the uh, predictions are made using homology to existing proteins with the help of uh, HMMs and, yeah, mostly HMMs. Another set of protein is called using gene mark S2+, which is an ab initio gene finder. We predict non-coding gene as well using tRNA scan, RFAN, and also homology. So that allows prediction of uh, tRNAs, small non-coding RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and we predict uh, CRISPR loci as well. The functional annotation is done uh, by a combination of uh, hits to uh, hidden Markov models to which we have assigned curated protein names um, as well as BLAST rules. Um, we also assigned function using the Sparkle engine. Um, we apply conserved domain architecture with Sparkle. And uh, as a last resort, we will use um, homology using BLAST-B. So uh, the typical workflow at the moment is that a, um, a scientist will collect samples, culture the organism, collect the DNA, sequence the genome, assemble it, and then submit to NCBI and request that we run PGAP on, on the genome. So what we're looking at doing is flipping the script a little bit and um, provide the ability to users to annotate the genome before they submit. And um, because if we do that, the submission become optional. And why is that a good thing? Because uh, there are many reasons why you may want to run PGAP yourself before you are ready, before, before you submit, or you may never want to submit. Uh, you may have some proprietary genomes that are not ready for publication or that will never be published. 
or you may be at the beginning of a project where you're trying to quickly characterize your starting material and uh, really your starting material has no place in the archives or you are trying to QC an assembly pipeline that you have put together or you have very large volumes of data and uh, submitting it to NCBI is just um, too much of a burden. And finally, why would you use PGAP over a different pipeline? So one of the reasons to do that is that uh, if you use PGAP, it allows a much less noisy comparison to PGAP annotated RESTIC assemblies because you eliminate the difference in, in annotation pipelines when you do your comparison. So all those were very good reason that uh, we have been thinking about for many years and that, um, that have really uh, prompted requests from users over the years. So finally, about two years ago, we started thinking of how we could put a standalone PGAP pipeline that uh, users could download and run on their own. And the goals that we had for that pipeline would be that it is publicly available, that the results conform with PGAP uh, run at NCBI, that the results would be uh, reproducible, the pipeline would be simple to use, and it would, put, um, it would produce results that are compliant with GenBank submission requirements. And finally, that pipeline would be easy to install. So um, in order to do this, we re-implemented uh, PGAP as we have it at NCBI in the Common Workflow Language, or CWL, which is an emerging standard for pipelines. So we converted it from a, essentially an internal pipeline language into CWL. We uh, went through uh, all the reference data set that is necessary to produce data identical to what PGAP would produce at NCBI and repackage uh, the minimal set of reference data necessary. And we added some validation of inputs in order uh, for the results to meet GenBank standards. So for example, we validate um, the sequence format. We validate the size of the genome that are provided, make sure that they are within range for the uh, genus species that is associated with the FASTD sequence. And we do run uh, the sequences through vector and adapter sequence detection. So how is standalone PGAP packaged? So a PGAP release is really two things. It's a Docker image that contains the pipeline written in CWL, as I mentioned. So that is the glue between the application. It contains the binaries. And it also contains CWL tool, which is currently the reference runner for CWL. In addition to that, a PGAP release includes reference data. This is located on S3 in AWS, and that contains custom BLAST databases, HMM model, a taxonomy database, anything that is really um, needed for the pipeline to run smoothly. In order to run PGAP, you need to uh, have a computer that is set up with um, Linux, Windows, or Mac OS X environment. You need to have Python version 3.5 or higher. You need to have installed Docker, and you need to have root access. This is important. Uh, you need a fairly large chunk of space. 100 gig is what we recommend. Keep in mind that the reference data itself will uh, occupy 41 gig uh, of free space. And we recommend an 8-core CPU, um, 32 gig memory machine. However, uh, you could go much lower than that. One CPU, 12 gig minimum is what we um, have found. So now let's go through an example and from downloading the pipeline to uh, running the genome and look at the output. So the first thing that you will need to do is choose where you want to run PGAP. And you can run it locally or you can run it on a compute farm at your institution or you can run it in the cloud. That really doesn't matter. So the first thing that you will do is download pgap.py, which is a convenient script that really allows you to do pretty much everything. To download the script, you can use curl as uh, represented in the command line I posted here on the slide. You can use wget. After you have the script, you have to make sure to make it executable. The next step is to download the Docker image and the reference data. And for that, you use that script that you just downloaded, pickup.py, with dash dash update. And it will start downloading what you need. 
the Docker image and the reference data. It will also extract uh, the, ref the tarball of reference data. And that will take several minutes. At the end, if it finishes successfully, you should have a message saying downloaded 100%. In the directory, you will notice the reference data. It's called input um, and then the, the name of the release. It will also include some um, input data for some um, example genome. So in particular, Microplasma genitalium, G37, is a very small genome. And uh, using that, the test data for Microplasma will allow you to quickly test that your installation is working correctly. So now let's annotate a Klebsia pneumonia genome. Um, so I picked a random genome from um, uh, that is available in assembly at the moment. So what do you need for this? How do you prepare the input? So the first thing that we will prepare here is a very small text file, six lines, which is really a pointer to two other files. Uh, the FASTA file, I think you're familiar with it, and another file of uh, metadata. Um, both the generic YAML file, so the six-line uh, file, and the metadata file are um, text file in YAML format. The metadata included um, in the second file includes um, the topology of the sequences. So in your multifaceted file, are the sequences uh, linear or are they circular? and includes the genus species from which uh, the DNA was extracted, and it inc includes the contact info for the per person who's submitting, and uh, an author. So now you have uh, downloaded the pipeline, and you have prepared the input, uh, so you're ready to annotate your genome. So this is the command line, so uh, kpneu.yaml is a small YAML file that we prepared. And there are two other parameters here, uh, dash r. Dash r is a parameter that will transmit to NCBI that the execution of the annotation has started, and then when it finishes, that the execution has stopped. And the reason we ask you uh, to please use that um, parameter is that it allows us to essentially justify our existence. It allows us to show our bosses that people are using our tool. And the second parameter here, oh, and I should say, um, all it collects is the start time, the end time, as well, and the random UIUD. So we are not collecting the final data that you get. We're not collecting the input data that you provide. It is very limited information. Also in the command line is uh, the dash O, which uh, uh, after which you uh, insert uh, the output directory name where you want to see the data. And it, everything goes well. Um, you will find the output in the in the directory that you specified, and uh, you will find after a couple of hours for uh, Klebsia genome about three hours, you will get the message that he got completed successfully. So one tip here is that if you are running remotely, if you use on an SSH connection, we recommend that you use screen Tmux or no hub in order to not lose your data if your connection um, goes away. So how does uh, PGAP work? What happens when you run the command line I just showed you? So this is, this is it. So pgap.py will pick up the very small YAML file that you prepared, and it will pick up the reference data and the Docker image, and it will instantiate a Docker container within which the, the uh, all execution is going to happen. So the first thing that it does, pgap.py will rearrange the input data that you provided and insert the reference data. And it will pass the input data to CWL tool, which is a CWL runner that takes the pipeline, the instructions of what should happen. So it, it takes the input and the pipeline, runs um, and distributes the job, essentially uh, runs steps after steps. So now let's review the results. The output format uh, that you get should be familiar to you if you're uh, familiar with PGAP at all. Uh, you will get um, a multifaceted file of annotated protein. You will get the annotated genomic sequence in SN.1 format, 
which is a format used for submission if you desire to submit your results. Uh, you will get the annotated genome in GFF3 format for using uh, for loading to genome browsers, for example. And you also get the annotated genomic sequence in GenBank flat file format. So now let's look, take a look at the outputs in uh, the GenBank uh, flat file format. This is, this is what you would see if you go into Entree and uh, type in uh, any, if you look any um, annotated genome in Entree, you would see it, it looks very similar. So the, what, the things I want to point out here is that the input that we provided are reflected in this output. We said that the sequences were linear. You can see that in the output. We said the organism was Klebsiella pneumonia. It's here. And we said the author was Peter Cooper. And the contacts um, are also reflected in the reference. A little below, you will see an annotation summary, something that should be uh, looking um, familiar if you have ever looked at genomes that were annotated with PGAP. That summary includes run information like who is the annotation provider. So your name here should appear or your name or your consortium name should appear here. Um, the date of the run, uh, which pipeline was used, in this case, of course, PGAP, and uh, which software revision exactly you used. And below this, uh, the annotation results will appear or a summary of the results, uh, feature counts essentially. And what I want to point out here is uh, if you look at the number of coding genes, it's 2,265 uh, 2, coding gene. This is the very low number for Klebsiella genome. What we expect is more in the range of 55, 50 to 5,600. Um, if you look a little below, you see there's a very large number of pseudogenes, and the cause for those being called pseudogenes is, is, is that they are frame shifted. So that points out uh, that sort of raises a red flag on the assembly itself and potentially indicates that there's a lot of indels in the assembly. And this is really an important reason why it's great for you to run PGAP before you submit. Uh, and really what you should do instead of submitting immediately, you should review the results and submit them only if they're high quality. If you don't find the results to be very satisfying, that gives you an opportunity to go back to your sequence or to the assembly and uh, fix what you think is have gone wrong. Um, so we hope that by putting PGAP in, the, in your hands, you, that cycle of annotating, reviewing, and going back to the message will uh, be much shorter. So a side note on how you can run PGAP on draft assembly. So at the beginning of the, of the talk, I explained that we, in addition to PGAP, we validate the sequences up front. Um, well, we have the opportunity to ignore this validation. So uh, for example, the genome size check, um, you could, you know, maybe you're just annotated plasmid, maybe you're just interested in a portion of the genomes, or maybe you don't know why, but your genome doesn't fit the size expected for the genus species. Well, you can ignore that uh, with that ignore dash all dash error flag. It will also ignore um, invalid sequence due to vector and adapter sequence. Those could be cleaned up later if you wish. And you will also ignore stretches of ends at the end of sequences. That flag also allows you to run on undefined species. So you may have an idea of the genus, but not the species. So this is convenient for to get a sense of the assembly quality early in your workflow. Uh, but you should be aware that the results that are produced may not comply with GenBank quality criteria. So if you intend to submit the results, this is not a flag that you want to use. So uh, moving on to what is coming soon. So uh, there's a couple of things that we've been uh, hard at work with. First is uh, support singularity as an alternative to Docker. The advantage of singularity over Docker is that um, it doesn't require root access. So the way things are going to work is that we'll still package the image um, in Docker. However, when it comes to running the pipeline, the container will be instantiating, uh, it, the container instantiated will be a singularity container uh, that doesn't require root. Um, we are also planning to add a taxonomic verification module 
um, which is the taxonomic verification is done by calculation of uh, the average nucleotide identity, ANI, which is a tool that Genbeck uh, uses when uh, evaluating the quality of assemblies that are submitted. Um, so that allows you to um, sort of get one step ahead and, and anticipate what sort of feedback you will get from Genbank. And finally, our PGAP currently requires network access, and we're working on lifting requirements for this, so that for people working in um, biodefense or who have some very sensitive data and don't want um, the pipeline to access the internet at any point, they can still run PGAP. So more information is available on GitHub. This is our site again. You can find the PGAP releases there. There's documentation on installation. There's ICQs. And very important, there's a form for you to report any issues. And uh, we really welcome any comment that you have, whether it's feature requests, whether you have problems. Uh, you know, we, we are really uh, committed to make your life easier. So don't hesitate. You can also look at open uh, past issues just to see whether other people have uh, run into the same problem that you have. Finally, I want to acknowledge all the members of the team. Uh, Azad Badreddin and uh, Douglas Slada have done the bulk of the work. Um, Slava Shedvernin, Radko Lavina, and Eyal Moses have also helped. Uh, Daniel Soren is a project manager. And uh, Ben Busby and Luis Gear have helped early on on uh, getting the, pro the project started. And finally, Jim Ossan Kimpret have given us uh, their support in addition to Eugene Yashenko. I also want to acknowledge Steve Turner, who was one of the users who really asked us, who was really motivated in having a pickup in his hands. And I want to thank you for your attention. And now, if you have questions, it's the time to ask. Thanks, Francois. A couple of questions came in, and they sort of relate to some other topics too. So, um, someone asked about, you know, how to create a text file, and they mentioned a bunch of different um, types of text editors. But I mean, the main point is it just needs to be plain text. But one of the questions that, that sort of comes from that is, what platforms can you run this on? So, can you run this on Windows and Mac and Linux, all those things, or is it only available for certain ones? Um, it can run on any operating system. Uh, we have most of our experiences in Linux, but there is there is possibility to run it on uh, Windows and uh, Mac OS X as well. So this is this is the operating system. What I'm talking about the operating system for the computer. Uh, you should know that the container itself runs uh, in Linux. Okay, thanks, Francis. Was um, also you mentioned the average nucleotide identity, and someone asked, can you skip that step? And, and Douglas actually uh, answered this into the question spot that the, the A and I will be optional, so you can choose to run PGAP only or A and I only or both. And so another question that's sort of related to this idea is, is there any, any consideration of lifting the requirements? So you mentioned, for example, that you could have an unknown species, but you could have a genus. Do you need to know the genus? Is there a way to go with like, if you don't know what it is? Yes, you need to know the genus. The reason for this is that um, the genus influences the set of protein that we align to genome, and especially the, uh, it really influences the weight that we give to certain um, proteins. So we will upweight the proteins that are references that are called reference protein that are annotated on reference genome for the genus. So if you change the genus, uh, then we will upweight potentially uh, proteins that are completely unrelated to the genome that you're annotated. So this is really the, the idea for um, requiring at a minimum the genus. And so wouldn't that be a way that the A&I could come into play? If you had something like that and you didn't know the genus, then at least that would give you, could even give you the species possibly, but probably would give you a genus level. Right, so ANI is not yet in the pipeline, but it, this is something that we could envision, is that um, you first run ANI to determine what's what's in your sample, essentially what you've sequenced, and then, um, so it would be a two-step process. First run ANI alone, and then when you get uh, an idea of what your species likely is, you would then run PGAP with the proper species that uh, ANI determined. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, thanks everybody. I don't see any more questions right now. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to write to us uh, at info at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. If you have questions about the webinar program in general, you can write to us at webinars at the same domain name, ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. And on this slide, there are some links to some general educational materials that we have on our website. Okay, so let's go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thanks everybody for coming, and I'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you.